drink of wine. Mama has that bottle to me. What a dream yeah. I had last night. Oh, yes, no, oh, hallelujah, I just love her so. Love, blip, blob, and fly. I don't care if I like all right. Erdogan, founder and head of Atlantic Records, produces a track with the modern jazz quartet. The son of a Turkish ambassador, Ahmet and elder brother Neshui fell in love with jazz as boys in Europe. When the family moved to Washington, Ahmet hooked up with a gang of jazz fans from the bebop generation. Among them were husband and wife Herb and Miriam Abramson. Together, they formed Atlantic Records. Record production rose to an estimated 325 million in 1947. To help in the build-up had come the public's enthusiastic discovery of swing. The idea of a record label was born. First releases were jazz records like trumpeter band leader Joe Morris's Beans and Cornbread and Herb's eccentric storybook invention, The Adventures of Bronco Bob. Ahmed and Herb recruited a young engineer who turned his skills from producing atomic bombs for the Manhattan Project to engineering records, Tom Dowd. Historically, I've always been recording, whether it was uh, sound or even slides. And I go romping through here, and I have a wonderful, wonderful picture Oh, here's the wild man, Herb, with his uh, third wife and my first wife. Hi, I'm uh, Herb Abramson. I'm one of the founders of Atlantic Records. Atlantic was born of a collaboration and a partnership between Herb Abramson and Ahmet Erdogan, or we should say Ahmet Erdogan and Herb Abramson, who complemented each other and had the oversight, the, the, the uh, understanding of the possibilities of the market to make a, a terrific company. So in the first five years of, 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 its, of, of the company, we had on the contract Ray Charles, Joe Turner, Ivory Joe Hunter, Ruth Brown, Laverne Baker. Miriam, Herb's first wife. The one woman in the organization that did all the dirty work. Herb, Ahmed, yours truly. We never had to yell anybody about you owe us or send us this and that. They'd be delighted if we asked them. The last person they wanted to hear from was Miriam, and she took care of business. The idea of the record company was really an outgrowth of the hobbies of all of us. We were all jazz fans. We were interested in jazz, and we thought we could have a company that would specialize in the kind of music that was being largely ignored by the large companies. There were large companies at the time, and very few independents. Um, the playboy, the daredevil, being an ambassador's son, raised multilingual, debonair, the continental. And here is Ahmed Erdogan, without the beard, with a little bit of hair. It, it kind of makes you think. It's been a long, long, long time. A lot of water going under the bridge, but boy, have we had a ball. The first 
Atlantic record that really started to sell was a thing called Drinking Wine Sportioti by uh, Granville Stick McGee, who happened to be the younger brother of the blues singer Brownie McGee. In fact, Brownie McGee is singing background to his brother on Drinking Wine Sportioti. And that was a record that crossed over into the rhythm and blues market. Down in New Orleans where everything's fine, all them cats is drinking that wine, drinking that mess, their delight. When the kids are drunk, start singing all night, drinking wine, spoo to you, they drink wine, pop, pop, wine, spoo to you, they drink wine, pop, pop, wine, spoo to you, they drink wine, pop, pop, yes, that follow to me. Drink and wine first broke in New Orleans, so Ahmed and Herb borrowed a car and headed south. There, they found acts like blues singer Blind Willie McTell and a barrel house pianist Professor Longhair. These signings set the tone for Atlantic sound of authentic black music. Today, Atlantic is a vibrant label under the umbrella of the Time Warner Media conglomerate. But it was its years as an independent and its ability to challenge the major record company's notion of popular music that makes the Atlantic story unique. I wanted to make records that sounded, you know, like the records I loved, which are like, you know, real blues records. And I thought that I could reproduce that somehow. We had no money, we had very small budgets, and we had to record whatever we could find. The first recordings we made were just terrible. I shudder now when I hear them on these early Atlantic releases. The people in the music business did not understand where the real American taste was. They were making songs for a bourgeois society that they imagined existed in this country. You played the first single, uh, I believe it went top 10 there. This record has just been exploding in Oklahoma City. You know, the people at RCA Victor, they didn't know shit from Shinola. And they didn't know that I Want to Rock You Baby had more meaning than I'm putting on my top hat, polishing my nails. It had not, not a particular appeal to a longshoreman in Seattle or a cotton picker in Alabama. Picking up each week. And you know, Mike, this is coming off of your airplay. So he signed up this girl, Ruth Brown, whose idol was Doris Day. I said, no, you got to sing like Miss Cornchucks. And she said, I don't want to sing like Miss Cornchucks. I want to sing like Doris Day. I said, well, you know, I can't sell any records sing like Doris Day. I love would always be. I wouldn't be blue and lonely well if you come back to me every single cloud. The relationship between the artists and uh, the people who signed us at that time was like a real family affair. I remember Amit and her both coming up to Harlem so often and visiting all the places on 125th Street. You know, the Club Baby Grand or going to Frank's Cafe for dinner or the Apollo Bar. And on the opposite side of the street, you would find Wells' House of Chicken and Waffles, which is where everybody hung out, you know. Washington in the late 30s and 40s, it was like a southern city, and black people were totally excluded from most of the amenities afforded by the city to the white population. There was total segregation, and it was difficult for us because we had a lot of black friends in Washington, and we had to meet them either at their house or they would come to our house, which was the Turkish embassy then. We started to have these Sunday lunches at the Turkish Embassy where we invited the musicians who would usually play on a Saturday night in Washington. We'd have jam sessions and a lot of very famous musicians played at the jam sessions, such as Rex Stewart, uh, Joe Marsala, famous Chicago-style clarinet player. 
My brother and I, Nessui, we became friends of uh, Teddy Wuss and Lena Horne and, and Duke Ellington. And we put on the first integrated concert in Washington where we had black and white members of the orchestra on stage. People like Lester Young, Pee Wee Russell, Henry Allen, J.C. Higginbotham, uh, members of the Count Basie Band, members of the Duke Ellington Band. And also we had an integrated audience. I felt that I knew what black life was in America. And I knew what black music was in America. And I knew what black roots and what black gospel music and black blues from the Delta uh, that went on to Chicago and the Texas blues that went on to the West Coast. I knew what they were, and I knew all about that, and I loved all of that. So in loving America, I thought I loved something more than the average American knew about. With the signing of the Clovers, Ahmed had to write them a song. It was his first, and he signed it Nugetri, Erdogan spelled backwards. I don't you know, I love you, love so. We signed the Clovers. Ahmet sat down and wrote a blues uh, song for them called Don't You Know I Love You. And it was a hit when we put it out. So that encouraged them. And the sobriquet of Nugetri, which is Erdogan spelled backwards, he, uh, he wrote quite a few uh, good songs. So as I say, he was hip, hip to the tip, as we say. In other words, he was not a square. He was, he was somebody who understood the idiom. Clovers are blooming in jukeboxes all over the country. Flowers, you know. So when I got the Clovers, I said, well, I can't get a song. I will start to write songs out of necessity. You know, the publishers, they didn't want to give us anything anyway, because they thought the little company was out of a little hole in the wall, you know. So I forced them to record this song. A miracle happened. I was never in my life so amazed. All I could hear was this song blaring out of all these music shops. I mean, the Clovers did not want to sing it, you know. It was forcing soul on the feet, you know. I can't forget you, darling. The one left out in the cold. I guess I still love you and will always be the same. could write a lyric faster than some of the people we hired to write lyrics. You look at the hits that Nuggetry wrote. I mean, it's frightening. What we were doing was having a good time. We'd lived through a hell of a time. We'd, we'd survived the war and every other fool thing. And here we were finally playing. But we were 25 and 30 year olds playing. And we're having a good old time making records and, and telling stories and, and communicating with people who were not the spoon-fed people that you're accustomed to hearing ah, by the major record the company. Barbecue, the band was jumping, the people too, ah, mess around. They're doing the mess around. We started Atlantic Records with $10,000. It cost $3,000 to buy Ray Charles's contract. And I tried to make Ray Charles make records like we were making hits with the Clovers. 
But it didn't work with Ray Charles. What we told him was not as good as what would happen if we didn't go around with him and let him do what he wanted to do. Because he got his shit together when he got his own band. Charles imitated Nat King Cole, but when Ahmet gave him a classy, brassy band, Brother Ray found his real voice. Somewhere along the line, Herb uh, had to go back in the military service, and he and Miriam, hoping that they could defeat the process, had a baby. It didn't do any good. Herb still had to go back to the military. Herb, who had received an education in the Army as a dentist, was uh, redrafted and went to Germany. And we needed somebody to help Ahmed with the recordings. And Jerry Wexler was a friend of all of ours. His taste in music was about the same. So he came in to fill the gap. Then when Herb came back, Jerry remained. Of course, he was a partner. But I think at that point, Herb began to feel like he was the fifth wheel on the wagon. Since I met you, baby, my whole life has changed. Ahmed and Herb Abramson asked me if I'd like to go to work for them. So I had the nerve to suggest, take me in as a partner. They thought that was hilarious. This could be good. Yeah, for Loopy, please, is Jerry Wexler returning his call? He has stepped out to get a bite to eat. A year later, they came back to me and said, you can come in as a partner. Miriam Abramson dumped the mail on my desk and said, go to work. I went to work. It was the top floor of 234 West 56th Street over Patsy's restaurant. We had one big room toward the front of the office at, on the street side facing 56th Street. And Ahmed and I each had a desk that was sort of catty cornered to each other. When we had a recording session, we would move the, the desks to the wall and we'd put one desk on top of another. And that's where I got some back trouble that lasted me for several decades. And Tom Dowd, our young engineer, the boy wonder, would set up some folding chairs, some camp chairs, and a few microphones. I say few because in those days we didn't mic everything. And after the session broke down, the desk would move back, and it, would became, an, it became an office again. <laughs> The business escalated and the company got bigger. So when I returned in 1955, I didn't want to break up the team that had been working so good together. But then we started Atco Records, and that was like a subsidiary that I produced things on my own. And among the records I made, I did A Tear Fell with Ivory Joe Hunter and Seven Days for Clyde McFadder. And Atco was pretty hot. If we didn't make a hit, record to release next week or the week after then we wouldn't collect for the record that we sold last month you have to have a hit in order to collect for last month's record otherwise you're out of business you have to be the bank of america if you didn't have two hits back to back so we were always looking for songs artists and make a hit make a hit make a hit yeah, all the time with clyde mcfatter and the drifters atlantic found a magnificent gospel-based vocalist 
who also gave the company its first brush with the sensor. I need it when the moon is bright. I need it when you hold me tight. I need it in the middle of the night. I need your honey love. I want it when the lights are low. I want it just before you go. I, I co-wrote a song with Clyde McFadden. He had pretty much had the format of uh, talking about honey love. And it would seem perfectly innocent, almost naive today. But back then, because the words seemed to suggest something dirty, <laughs> which was uh, sexual uh, satisfaction, this was so shocking that the police chief in Memphis banned it off the jukeboxes. Uh, imagine being banned off jukeboxes in juke joints where the booze was flowing and the reefer and whatever. To me, it was an honor. It was like being on Nixon's enemy list. <laughs> a song by black writer Jesse Stone, recorded at 23456, set a new direction in American music. Jesse's coded lyrics said one thing while meaning something a lot different. Wash your face and hands. Where you get in that kitchen, make some noise with the pots and bands. The words had to be cleaned up for radio. Jesse's original lyrics were never published as sheet music. I asked Jesse Stone to come up with some material for, for Joe Turner. Now, Jesse Stone is a prolific songwriter, but he said at this time he merely went into his trunk and put, picked out uh, a group of uh, blues uh, verses and strung them together and uh, uh, the result was uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll, which became a tremendous uh, hit. They call him Big Joe Turner, the daddy of the blues, and I like to set a tempo sort of like this for him to bring him on. Hey, Big Joe Turner! Come on in! Shake, rattle, and roll. We needed a vocal backing group, and we didn't have anybody around. So, Ahmed and I and Jesse Stone, we just went back to Joe's microphone and we hollered, "Shake, rattle, and roll." Shake, rattle. We were the vocal group. I like the line. I'm like a one-eyed cat peeping in a seafood store. I can look at you and see you ain't no child no more. And it says, when you wear those dresses, the sun comes shining through. I can't believe my eyes. All that mess belongs to you. It was about sexual congress. <laughs> yeah, it was about uh, a man and a woman making the beast with two backs. <laughs> but they had to clean them up for radio in those days. Like a one eyed cat, peeping in a people's door. Like a one eyed cat, peeping in a people's door. Thank <laughs> you. 
rhythm and blues, as we knew it, was a post-World War II development. And we sort of grew into it with the development of the music. And this was pre-rock and roll. And when the transformation came from rhythm and blues over into rock, we were right there. I mean, we, you know, we helped pull the baby out. We were the midwives. Stage will continue in a moment on A&E. The Atlantic Record Story. With Shaboom by the chords, the majors began to take notice of the red and black logo. Our music was segregated music. It was black music for black adults, and it was played on black radio stations. If this didn't exist, then the independent record company would never have had a chance to exist and flourish against the majors. Rufus Thomas, comedian, DJ, songwriter, and singer, worked at WDIA, the Memphis radio station that broke the color bar. Matt D. Williams was the first black disc jockey to play music on a radio station in the country. He was a history teacher, my history teacher in high school. When the microphone opened one morning and Nat's voice came out on the air, it was something like never before. The clients who had advertised on the radio station pulled their products off. They didn't want no black man advertising that product. And that was a constant thing for a bit. And then the advertisers found out that there was money in the black market. So one by one, little by little, they came back. When it became apparent that this black music had great potential commercially for sales, it was an opening for the entrepreneurs to take the black music, cover it, record it with white people, copy it literally, and then put it out on the market. People like our engineer Tom Dowd, as a freelance engineer, going over to Mercury Records or MGM, and recording the same song with a white artist, and our record will be on the turntable in the control room to get the exact key, the exact beat, the exact cadences, and to copy the record as closely as possible. One of the most famous examples of that was Shaboom by the Crew Cuts, covering our original record by the chords, or the chord cats as they were called and they really wiped us out. People never knew Joe Turner made Shake, Rattle, and Roll before Bill Haley. People never knew Laverne Baker made Tweedly Dee before Georgia Gibbs. People never knew a group called the Chord Cats made Shaboom before the Crew Cuts. If Laverne Baker did a session last night, day after tomorrow, Monday, I'd get a call from Mercury Records. Can you be in the studio and we got to do two sides with Georgia? And they're covering the sides that just came out with Laverne. The only thing is they're using different backup singers and different conductor and arranger. Just make it sound the same. Only different guys. You know. <laughs> And now I want one big gigantic ovation for a lady who, in my estimation, has been leading blues singing for many, many years. A lot of popular singers have copied her, and uh, today she is, well, first and foremost in the blues field. Laverne Baker. <laughs> Jim Daddy, love Jim Daddy. 
Swam the ocean in a suit of steel uh-huh. With a sign saying my love is real uh-huh. uh, Jim Daddy got married uh-huh. Love Jim Daddy, love Jim Daddy uh, Jim Daddy got married Today, with the passage of time, those cover records are looked upon as absurdities. I mean, who cares about uh, Pat Boone doing a Fat Domino record? It's Fat Domino that counts. Who cares about Bill Haley? The original record has persisted, at least in the consciousness of the public, if not in the sales. It's a rare example in our uh, commercial culture of art winning out over commerce if you wait long enough. <laughs> Jim Daddy was a nickname Dan, uh-huh. luckiest cat in the whole of land. Uh-huh. Love me so well, it seems. Uh-huh. In a month, she was plumb insane. Uh-huh. Jim Daddy got a married. Uh-huh. Love Jim Daddy, love Jim Daddy. If you go with the notion that black music is the hallmark, it's the, it's the gravamen of our culture. Although it was parochial and it stayed in the black community for decades and maybe for centuries, and it didn't come out, when it finally did emerge, it captured the sensibility of the whole world. And Elvis Presley was the enunciator, he was the messiah, because he was the funnel that taught the white world the joys, the euphoria, and the pleasures of black music. Elvis Presley, a poor white teenager, sang in a country hillbilly blues style. When Ahmet heard his early son recordings, he made a pitch to sign Elvis to Atlantic. I noticed uh, at one point that we were getting royalty checks for some of the songs that we published, and we're getting royalty checks from this little record company uh, who, were, who was re- recording some of the same songs with a white singer named Elvis Presley. And I listened to the early Presley records, and I thought, well, here's a guy who really is unbelievably talented and a great singer uh, and who understands black music. Uh, so we went after him. So we offered $25,000 for his contract. Colonel Parker asked for $45,000. We didn't have $45,000 in the bank, so I couldn't sign him. But he signed with RCA Victor for $45,000. The Major's ability to outbid him for Elvis convinced Domit that in order to survive, his label needed a firm foothold in the mass white market. Next, rockin' and rollin' with Bobby Darin. The Atlantic Records Story will continue on A&E. To the Atlantic Records Story. Splish, splash, I was taking a bell. Long about a Saturday night. Yeah. Rubbed up, just relaxing in the tub. Thinking everything was all right. When I stepped out the tub, put my feet on the floor. I wrapped the towel around me and I opened the door And in a splish splash, I jumped back in the bath Well, how was I to know there was a party going on? It was a splishing and a splash Feeling with the feeling, moving and a groove And rocking and a rolling, yeah, yeah We had a roster of maybe 20 black performers And we were going along very happily in a modest way when Bobby Darren came into the picture. Bing bang, I saw the whole gang dancing on my living room rug. Yeah, flip flop, they were doing the bop. All the teens had to dance in book. There was lollipop with a Peggy Sue. Ahmed went in and recorded the song Splish Splash, which I must admit I thought was utter garbage. This was our entree into the big white picture, the pop picture. Herb's role at Atlantic became clouded. He'd had no success with Darren and was ready to drop him from the label before Ahmet stepped in. This, plus the strain of Herb's failing relationship with Miriam, finally took its toll. I, I, uh, listen, what happened, happened, you know. Uh, that's water under the bridge. I, I left because of, uh, of uh, differences with my partners, where, where 
We didn't uh, see eye to eye or get along well. So I sold out and I started my own operation. <laughs> that was a mistake, but that's what I did, you know? But I want to say that I'm proud to have been the co-founder of Atlantic Records and to set its tone, encompassing the mystique that it has as a label. At a certain year, Herb left the company voluntarily. And Ahmed and I, we brought Nessui into the company. And of course, it was one of the great moves that really elevated Atlantic Records into an all-around eclectic record company because he developed one of the great jazz lines, you know, of all time. Okay, okay. Ahmed's slate to brother Nesui had been the real jazz connoisseur in the family. His signings helped the company claim its share of the new market for long-playing records, while also widening its profile yeah, and stature. Right. Memories of you, take one. Take two. Really what propelled me the most toward uh, this avocation of jazz music was my older brother, Nesui, who was more than a fan. He was a critic and uh, eventually taught the first course ever given for credit in America on jazz. It's a very unusual thing. I reflect on it. it. Now you can become analytical. It's a crazy collection of eclectics. I mean, <laughs> here's Ahmed Erdogan, who's a jazz fan, the way American children still to this day collect Batman cards and Superman cards, baseball and football cards. Ahmed Erdogan and his brother Nesri, when they were in Turkey and when they were in Europe in school, were staying up nights listening to BBC radio and jazz when they were 10, 11, 12, 13. They'd sneak a radio into bed with them in 1936, 7, and 8 and listen to jazz. and we're becoming a full-line record company and our jazz division was growing in leaps and bounds and we had some of the greatest recordings made by Coltrane so it, it was a great time <laughs> Nesui had since joined the company and was doing nothing but jazz. The best album that I have had the pleasure of being a part of making, the genius of Ray Charles album, which we had done in 1958-59 on Atlantic Records, where we had the Ray Charles band playing along with the Quincy Jones arrangements of the Count Basie and Duke Ellington bands. We had put an enormous group of bands together and had them all playing simultaneously in the first genius of Ray Charles album. Ray was the complete recording artist. Ray took gospel music and put the devil's words to it, and he started something which is just routine today.
gotta go out and spend some cash and let the good time roll, baby. a relationship with the people we recorded uh, that we thought was a very personal one. And then somebody like Clyde McFadder left. Bobby Darren left. At one point, uh, Ray Charles left. We were really stunned and hurt personally. I don't think it hurt us in a financial way so much because at that time we were beginning to grow and we had a lot of other resources, but on a psychological and a social level, it was very hurtful. And I'm still sore at Ray Charles for having left us. I really am, because I thought it was very, very unfair, and I thought he could have stayed with us, and we could have done for him what anybody else could do for him. But, I mean, that's all water under the bridge, as they say. <laughs> Coming up, Wilson Pickett plus Benny King when the Atlantic Records story returns on A&E. Mm -hmm. As the 50s became the 60s, the creative emphasis shifted from singers and musicians to writer-producers, and Atlantic signed the best hit factory of the time, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. Lieber and Stoller's writing skills for Elvis and the Drifters are legendary. But their early success as a team started with the coasters on songs like Smokey Joe's Cafe, Poison Ivy, Yakety Yak, and the double-sided hit Young Blood and Searchin'. to a large part of the black population. And from that came then the doo-wop period. You know, the doo-wop period was a much more urban, more sophisticated form of music than the blues had been. Quartet solos scrape a living from songs by the legendary drifters. Under the boardwalk, up on the roof, on Broadway, save the last dance for me. The number of hits recorded by the drifters during their long history was matched by the number of fine lead singers who drifted in and out of the lineup. They made the drifters kings of uptown rhythm and blues. One drifter who went on to have a successful solo career under Ahmet's guidance was Benny King. When this old world starts getting me down And people are just too much for me to fail I first met Ahmet when he was in the studio and he was explaining to us that we had to go in to do the first recording as a new set of drifters. Matter of fact, I wrote a song called There Goes My Baby for that same recording. Uh, it happened to be a song that Jerry Wexler hated, but Ahmed liked, and he thought it was going to be a hit. Uh, also, it's the kind of song that, uh, from what I've been told, is the very first R&B song to have strings on it.
true drifter's fashion of interchangeable lead singers, Charlie Thomas mimes to Benny King's vocal. Charlie Thomas couldn't learn the words to the song. So Ahmed had pushed the button and said, look, Benny, you sing the song. Uh, up to that point, I wasn't a lead singer. I was not intended to be a lead singer. And from that time to, to now, uh, whenever I think about how my career started, I often look out and I, I see Ahmed's face. I say, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> when the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see no, I won't be afraid, oh, I, I won't be afraid, just as long as you stand, stand by me. Stand By Me is a song that I wrote to um, give to the Drifters, although I wasn't in the group anymore because I had an argument with the manager and <laughs> he threw me out the group. I think the reason that I... Um, more or less song the song the way everybody feels that I had a lot of personal involvement in the lyrics and it was sad to hear the expressions that I was doing with the song it was basically because I was not the one that had made plans to sing the song. I was upset because the Drifters wasn't singing the song and secondly I was upset because I have, have not yet heard the song done the way I want to hear it and that was by the Drifters and uh, I think that was the pain and the something that you hear and heard in the voice as I was doing it. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid No, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by me So darling, darling, stand by me Oh, stand by me Oh, stand, stand by me, stand by me. <laughs> Cheat a little bit, I won't do all of it. <laughs> we place such an emphasis at Atlantic Records on bel canto, on great ability, on a Joe Turner who could have been an opera singer with that beautiful, great big rolling, tumbling voice of his, of an Aretha Franklin who is the diva of all time, the black diva of all time, of a Ray Charles, uh, of uh, Solomon Burke, who uh, a friend of mine once said, we were talking about who the best soul singer was, and it was suggested Sam Cooke, Marvin Gaye, Wilson Pickett, uh, uh, I forget who else, but he came out with the line, he said Solomon Burke with a borrowed band, because Solomon never had his own musicians. <laughs> the father of soul and I can say that truthfully because when we came to him with the idea of soul music he says I don't know rhythm and blues is where it's at he said it's gonna be hard breaking into this soul thing is that what you really want to do I says you gotta do it you gotta help me do this and he says all right how do you want to do it I says can we put on my album rock and soul he says may not help but it may hurt. I says, can we do it? He says, you got it. So we released an album with Rock and Soul, the King of Rock and Soul. And uh, that was the beginning of, of a lot of the movement, a lot of the words soul music, the soul movement. People would ask me why and how I would sing country and western songs and ballads and things like that. And uh, with the feeling and the expression, we were the first black artists to ever have a country and western song. <clears throat> that was played nationally on radio and television and ever reached the charts. Me having the first 
country and western record, uh, we had crossed the color barrier. And it was a very exciting situation to see these things happen in the early 60s. Feeling all the time. Knowing you could not be mine. Dreams that hurt me in my sleep. Vows that we could never, never keep. So far away from you. records has certainly opened their doors and minds to a lot of new things. There'll always be a red and black label, and when people pick it up, they'll always remember that there was an era called Soul that still exists. With you, man. Coming up, the one and only Otis Redding. The Atlantic record story continues in a moment on A&E. Captain, so wonderful. The Atlantic record story. the political and religious movements of the 60s, Jerry Wexler signed soul acts like Wilson Pickett and Pretty Boy Don Covey. He helped transform Covey into a great soul songwriter with hits like Seesaw and Mercy Mercy. Jerry's success was achieved by taking Covey and his other artists to Memphis. It was the dawning of the Atlantic Stax era. Well, I would say a lot of the soul people, they recognize one thing, that they had gospel music, and they had soul singers who was converted gospel people. And soul is, it's like a, it's, it's a vibe. It's, some people say vibe, some people say spirit, some people say groove, you call it many different things, but it's the, it's the reaching of the spirits of, of touching, almost like a minister, you're touching the spirits that's in the audience or, or, or out there. And that was the soul of the music that was taken further. And then when it came to the South and they crossbreed, uh, and it became the Stax and the uh, Atlantic type of sound. A converted cinema in a poor neighborhood of East Memphis was the down-home base of Stax Records. Jerry struck a distribution and recording deal with its founders, Jim Stewart and his sister, Estelle Axton. It was an inspired move, and what attracted him was the simplicity, power, and funk of the Stax House Band, Booker T and the MGs. in Memphis has long gone. The communication between Jim Stewart and Jerry Wexler broke down, and Stax went its own way, eventually into bankruptcy. But for half a decade, the collaboration between the two independents bloomed. Their first national success was with Gee Whiz, a song by Carla Thomas, Only Sweet Sixteen. We're not Mr. Stewart. And this lady here, it would be no stacks. This right here standing here is just 
It's a real good feeling to see her after this driving by. I saw her standing here. So who, I said, who is that witness actually in our house? <laughs> <laughs> then I started working for the record shop. Then uh, I had a group called the Mad Lads. Well, we were the Emeralds then. And she had a song on the radio that was uh, by Lil Anthony Imperials. I'm on the outside looking in. She said, if I had a group that could sing it like that, I'd sign them tomorrow. So we went home and practiced at night. And we did it for her in the record shop the next day. And we got we got to deal with our first record, Sidewalk Sir. It, it, it all was like magic. So many magic. things yeah, it, was, it, was, it was really like magic. Otis Redden was, Otis Redden was a, a roadie. <laughs> That's what I was telling with his, with his guitar wrapped up. He never played as much. Uh -uh. But he was great. The, he walked in the door. I've been loving you. Too long to stop now. You will die and you want to be me. My love is growing stronger as you. Become a habit to me. I've been loving you oh too long, and I don't want to stop now. Oh. Can you do that one more time, Al? Just like that. Do it just one more time, one more. So Otis Redding could probably say, baby. Hey, that baby, baby, the way he said it, maybe 200,000, 300,000 records. The feeling, how to make, take that word out of the dictionary and say, okay, let's make them really, really get into it. And it's a part of, 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 of your expressing your insides, you know, bringing that out, but bringing it out and making the community or the people or the audience feel that that's me. The socioeconomic impulse that gave rise to this had a lot to do with what you would call the rising aspirations of the ghetto, the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And of course, it caught the rising tide of Martin Luther King and all of that good hope. A whole roster of new singers sprang up along with this that to deliver this pop gospel. Wilson Pickett, it was a shouter from the church.
Well, contribution-wise, I think Jay Wexler was a real inspiration to all of us. Well, like in the Midnight Hour, but I had a guitar rhythm going, you know, a complicated, intricate thing, you know, trying to show off, I guess. And Jerry said, no, that's not the way they do it, you know, and he started to look like he was kind of shadow boxing. We kind of made fun of him. He looked like a boxer, you know, kind of shadow boxing. But what he was really trying to show us was this new dance that they were doing up in New York called the Jerk this kind of thing and so we started just kind of mocking him and, and al and i got into this thing and we started putting this backbeat this sort of delayed backbeat watching jerry dance around the studio and that's the rhythm on midnight hour it's still there today next the heavy metal sound of cream plus led zeppelin stay with us for more of the atlantic record story on a and e stage returns to the atlantic record story that there was a wave of new music coming in. At that time, the Sonny and Cher made a territorial hit for Warner Brothers Records. Somehow, they called me up and they said, look, we're not getting along with uh, Warner Brothers Records, and they forgot, they overlooked picking up their option, so they're free. So I signed up, I signed up Sonny and Cher, and our first record was not only a territorial hit, it was a nationwide hit, and it was an international hit. I've got you, babe. And then I started to sign up the new wave of rock and roll bands, it's like Vanilla Fudge and the Young Rascals, the Buffalo Springfields, and within that group, three great guitar player singers, Richie Ferre, Stephen Stills, and Neil Young, which eventually led to Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and Atlantic was rolling. There's something happening here. But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop the children What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down And you fall fire Battle lines being drawn Nobody's right If everybody's wrong Young people speak in their mind Being involved with a song called For What It's Worth so by the Buffalo Springfield And my being very sensitive to How intelligently The protest was being delivered In the lyric of the song Now not too many people would pick up A newspaper anywhere in the United States and see a bunch of kids are getting shook down on the streets of Los Angeles at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night because they're holding up traffic or because they're jumping cars or something like that. But that's in essence what the song was about. And there's this whole underground of young people who can't find in the newspaper things that are vital to them, but they can find it on a record. Paranoia strikes deep into your life it will creep it starts when you're always afraid step out of line the man come and take you away away we better stop hey what's that sound everybody look what's going we better stop hey well, you see we're even talking about a time where there is a musical fusion process going on black is white white is black gospel and jazz are becoming rock 
rock primitive people who only know two or three chords aspire to better things and not knowing it are learning to play jazz scales or play with gospel feeling and all of a sudden here's this whole new ball coming out this whole new explosion it's not all stand in line aisle and file this is jazz this is black this is white this is pop this is that no it's all one big ball of wax coming together and and because of it's coming together there's got to be another explosion and then like 10 tangents and here we go again a whole new series of creative processes we're going to start <laughs> had started to commute London and Los Angeles and signing the different acts like cream. So Ahmed called me up and said, there'll be a group here tomorrow. They've got to be on a plane at seven o'clock Sunday. That was the first cream album. That was the Israeli gears. We started on a Thursday at 11 o'clock. And when I put them, when a limousine driver came in the studio Sunday at five o'clock and said, I'm looking for a group. I said, they're ready. <laughs> and the three guys got in the plane and they were gone. And we did the album in three days. All right. So that started my association with Eric Clapton. Cream's success encouraged Atlantic to sign more British bands. Dusty Springfield, recording in Memphis, tipped Jerry Wexler off to a band being formed due to Eric Clapton's departure to Cream. Hard rock and heavy metal were just a power chord away. They became Led Zeppelin. As the late 60s had arrived and the whole sort of West Coast scene had developed in America and the British invasion had taken place, that their dealings had really been with Cream, with Eric Clapton and Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker. But also they had been developing the career of Buffalo Springfield, which to me, I had a real big lean towards Buffalo Springfield and uh, towards the work of Stephen Stills and Neil Young. And so the whole idea of our first efforts being taken over there and being looked at by or listened to was a great, real, I was really proud. And the fact that we were signed up by them was amazing. And the fact that I got £8,000 was even more amazing. Uh, <clears throat> so it was the beginning of an incredible relationship and that was 19th century, all this kind of thing moving all the time. And Atlantic were always able, by whatever means, from um, what I can clean, but by whatever means they managed to capture some of the, the hottest stuff, even if they were doing a deal with Stax or they were having a little thing here and there, they were always, for us in England, the label said that it was going to be good. You didn't get any, um, any crap. Coming up, the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. The Atlantic Records story returns in a moment on a &E. Returns to the Atlantic Records story. Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting when the evening comes Watching the ships roll in Then I watch them roll away again Yeah, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay Watching the tide roll away Ooh, yeah. Sitting on the dock of the bay I left my home in Georgia, headed for the Frisco Bay. Cause I've had nothing to live for, and look like nothing's gonna come back. Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay was one of the last great Atlantic Stack sessions before the relationship soured. Jerry headed further south to Alabama's Fame Studios, where the house band, the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section, had a similar drive and groove to Booker T and the MGs. Here, he recorded more classics, including Pickett's Mustang Sally, and the first big hit for the Queen of Soul, Miss Aretha Franklin. Mustang Sally! Jimmy Johnson, David Hood, Barry Beckett, the Muscle Shows Rhythm Section. It started rolling really well. I was really young, not quite sure of myself, and drummer. 
and uh, sitting there playing on uh, either Mustang Sally or one of those songs, Land of a Thousand Dances. And Jerry comes up to me and he says, Roger. I said, yes, sir. He says, you are a great drummer. And no one ever told me that I was a great drummer before. And I'm thinking, my God, this man has told me I'm a great drummer. That probably made me a great drummer for a while, you know, just, just because he said that. Well, he helped put the area on the map. Uh, when you started hearing the Mustang Sallies and the Land of a Thousand Dances and the Aretha Franklin and all that, he made those records here in this town. I'd been watching Aretha Franklin on Columbia for many years. It was almost a dream of mine, a notion that I'd like to sign her up for Atlantic Records. As far as how to record her, just keep doing more or less what we had been doing with our rhythm and blues artists, to let this sound emerge and be heard and not try to make it palatable to a white audience. Just let it out. So with attention to being meticulous about those matters, but at the same time, getting into the the depth, the soul of the artist and letting the music be heard was the idea was to record her with great musicians and put her at the piano and let her sing and play for herself. There's profusion of studios in Muscle Shoals. Fame Recording was the original studio and that's where we recorded Aretha Franklin on the first Atlantic recording day. first song that I recorded with Atlantic Records was in uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and it was I Never Loved a Man. Atlantic was a very hot label when I signed with them. I had been with Columbia prior to Atlantic Records for five years. I had not had a hit uh, during my stay with Columbia. What I had was what they call turntable hits. I got a lot of airplay and uh, a lot of critical acclaim, but no hits. Hey, what Most of the material was very stylized, and I think that made the difference. And Mr. Wexler usually wanted to know what it was I wanted to do, and then he would submit things, and we would have long listening sessions, and uh, usually dinner at his home sometimes. Um, and thereafter, we would make our selections. Oh, my God. 
death of Martin Luther King and the white backlash that came after the Civil Rights Act. Soul music seemed to be extinguished all at once. The Stax empire went down, Otis Redding died, Sam and Dave's records ground to a shuddering halt. Solomon Burke left the label, Don Covey left the label, Benny King left the label. And I had a very funny feeling in my bones when we were in the height of all of this. I, even told them, I said, I have a strange feeling that we're going to come to the end. Maybe things were just uh, accumulating, little details. The whole picture changed. And Rhythm and Blues, which had been the mainstay of Atlantic Records, it was not only subordinated now by white rock music, but it actually was virtually exterminated. Next, the original bad boys of rock and roll, the Rolling Stones. Stay with us for more of the Atlantic Record Story here on A&E. Turns to the Atlantic Record Story. And Mick, the thing is, Mick, he got to finish this record. This record's going to be great. It's going to be a great record. We're going to put all our resources behind the record. But listen. The promotion, forget the promotion. We don't want to spend money on the promotion. <laughs> we just have a big party and promote the shit out of the party, and that'll sell the record. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> To them, it wasn't just a can of baked beans, you know, which is like, unfortunately, a lot of record companies treat everything. You know, they get rid of it, make it and get rid of it. And uh, we had three more tracks to, that we needed for an album. And we were, I think we were playing in Florida. And we had to get to San Francisco to do next, what turned out to be Altamont. <laughs> and. Everybody's saying, where can we do this? Uh, we can't, we won't be able to get to New York or LA from where we are. And then everybody said, what about that great room that they cut all the soul stuff in? You know, they just, yeah, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name? Ah, Muscle Shorts. I met Ahmed in the 60s with Phil Spector, and he already was a sort of semi-legendary figure. I always liked him. We had this long contract with Decca Records. So when we were shopping around for a new Rolling Stones record deal, he was one of the people that wanted to sign the band. I mean, at least three quarters of it, Rolling Stones sort of thing rests upon various forms of R&B and so on. So we had those obvious rapport between him and us. Okay, the drums, uh, right. 
Because like when they're coming out, <laughs> you're shit. Yeah, but that's there. It doesn't come into the solo. No, I know, I know. <laughs> You got the move. They've written this tiny song, Brown Sugar and Wild Horses. And Ahmed was there also, because Ahmed was around on that tour quite a lot. And um, there was Jimmy Dickinson, and he played on Wild Horses, played tap piano. actually do what you wanted to do. I mean, this is a funny area, Florence, Alabama. But uh, I went in to cut three tracks, and and they came out great. Tom Dow was there. And, uh, I mean, I remember the most snakeskin. These guys, I mean, they created a record company, and, uh, and they loved what they were doing. They let the artist have enough room to be able to show themselves. I think that, that was really the, their master stroke. I guess it was really new for them to sign rock bands. Atlantic was still a, thought of as an R&B label. Ahmed had always been like, involved in that kind of music. But I think he wanted to branch out of the R&B thing into more mainstream kind of rock and roll, which had become, a, to a certain extent, respectable, and was also selling albums, because R&B music really didn't sell albums. And this is the beginning of the, the period where um, rock and roll was starting to really make money and really sell millions of albums. And a lot of these R&B acts, they had hit singles, but not all, but a lot of them never really sold albums in the millions. And then, um, quite soon after that, Atlantic was taken over by Warners. As we became larger and a lot of people wooed us with the idea of buying us, uh, personally, I felt it was wrong. If you're asking about how a woman felt, I felt that if we were absorbed into a large company and computers were starting to go, my job, which was on an individual level, would be over. On the other hand, I thought it was a very bad idea because I thought the company is just going to get bigger and bigger. I never thought it was going to fail. But it was bought, and uh, it was bought for what is t today a ridiculous amount of money. I still think it's a mistake, and probably the people who are in favor of the purchase also think it's a mistake. Gloria. being a subordinate. But those are the dues you pay when you're not an owner anymore. You're an employee. <laughs> and people perceive uh, many differences between me and Ahmed Erdogan, but basically we are very similar about the experiences we shared and the empathy we had for the music and the trials and tri tribulations of early recording, of going on the road, of uh, nurturing this business, this little record company, and of having tremendous laughs. Ahmed used to say one of these days we're going to laugh our way out of the record business because it was so much fun. <coughs> it was especially fun because everything we put out would hit. I mean, it was an amazing time there in the 50s and part of the 60s where every record sold. 
it seems like an impossible thing. But uh, there's nothing like success that keeps you smiling. <laughs> Today, I make a very caustic comment about the people in the record business. There are too many people running the record business today that if I say I need a note, they think, what how much money do you want? What interest do you want to pay? They don't know a bank note from a note on a staff of music. When you say note, the first thing that occurs to them is monetary. We're in the music business, guys. Give me a break, okay? Everybody that I talk about in those early days in the music business, Ahmed, Nesri, Jerry, Bashka Menon, Herb Alpert, all of these people read, could read, write music. They could sing. They could play something. They knew what the hell they were doing. to say that if my then partner, Ahmed Erdogan, had not exploited this area, I don't know if the label could have existed. And it was Ahmed's foresight and his uh, vision of what this music could bring that really made Atlantic from a little Tiffany, a specialty company doing interesting jazz, funk, rhythm and blues into a global giant. came to America, I already, you know, had vision of a strange land, uh, which included uh, Indians, cowboys, uh, gangsters, jazz musicians, beautiful black women dancers, and uh, movie stars, and uh, it was a very mixed idea of what America was. Oh, Basically, I loved the country and began looking for the things that I originally thought were in America, and eventually I found jazz, I found black music, and I finally got to see what America was really like. In the very beginning, I was really motivated by my love for the music and the desire of making historically important recordings, as well as recordings that people would want to buy. I think that we eventually began to achieve our aim, which was to make some records that would survive the test of time. Don't play that song for me. It seems the army wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Alan Arkin fakes insanity to get a ticket home Saturday in Catch-22. And now let's find out what it's like to go undercover next on a and &E Presents.
So that's the never-before-told secret of how Atlantic was born.